Uh, welcome to Hong Kong U Science uh, Distinguished Lecture. I'm uh, Michael Angie, uh, the Research Division Director for Mathematical and Statistical Science. Today, the lecture is le uh, about the learning from COVID-19 data on transmission health outcomes and interventions. So first of all, may I invite the Associate Dean of the Faculty of Science, Professor Goh, to introduce the, uh, the speaker today. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Professor Yun. Um, good morning, uh, dear colleagues, uh, fellow students, and guests. Uh, welcome to the Faculty of Sciences Distinguished Lecture uh, entitled uh, Learning from COVID-19 Data on Transmission Health Outcomes and Interventions. Uh, my name is Xiao Guo, uh, the Associate Dean of Global and China uh, in the faculty. Now, as we know, almost exactly a year ago, uh, COVID-19 has overturned our way of living dramatically. And this respiratory infectious disease, disease has become a pandemic now, affecting everyone in the world. Now, in this particular talk, we're fortunate to have a Professor Xu Honglin uh, who will provide an in-depth in -depth analysis of uh, over 32,000 lab confirmed COVID-19 cases in Wuhan to estimate the transmission rates uh, with use of a Poisson partial differential equation based transmission dynamic models. Uh, this model will be used to evaluate the effects of different public health interventions on controlling the 19 COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, this is including social distancing, isolation, and uh, quarantine. Now, Professor Lin will also present the results on the epidemiological characteristics of the cases, which are, will show the multifaceted intervention measures uh, successfully controlled the outbreak in Wuhan. Professor Lin will also present the transmission regression models for estimating transmission rates in the USA and other countries, uh, including factors such as uh, uh, social, uh, again, social distancing, test trees, isolation strategies that affect transmission rates. They will present analysis results of over 500,000 participants of the How We Feel project on symptoms and health conditions in the US. Now, Professor Xu Honglin is a professor and former chair of the Department of Biostatistics, coordinating director of the program in quantitative genomics of Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health and a professor of statistics at Harvard University also the associate member of the board, Inst Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Professor Lin is an elected member of the US National Academy of Medicine and received many distinguished awards, such as the 2006 President's Award and the 2017 Evan David Award from the Committee of Presidents of Statistical Societies. She's a former coordinate editor of Biometrics and the founding co-editor of Statistics in Biosciences. Now, Dr. Lin's research interests lie in the development and application of scalable statistic and computational methods for analysis of massive data from genome, exposome, phenome. She has been active in COVID-19 research, of course, in the past year. So without further ado, I would now like to pass the floor to Professor Lin to the new findings. And thank you so much, Dr. Guo, for the very kind introduction. And also thank you uh, for the very kind invitation. I'm pretty, very honored to share with you my work uh, and together with many of the colleagues uh, who had made a significant contribution. And so I'm going to share my screen and uh, so I'll do the full screen. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, let me see. 
You see two slides, right? One big yeah. slide, one yeah. small slide, right? So let me see how I can. This is better? Yeah, this is correct. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you. All right. Um, so uh, let me start from how the um, data look right now. And so this data that I just downloaded this data uh, yesterday. So as you can see that right now, there are over 91 million cases in the world and over 2 million, about 2 million deaths uh, worldwide. So on the left, uh, those are the number of uh, cases and in different country. In particular, you can see as the the number of cases in Ireland is rising very quickly, uh, uh, mainly due to the uh, new UK variants. And also the number of cases in UK and also in the US are going up. And then um, uh, so and also in Africa, if you look at it, there's uh, one country in Cambodia. And so you can see the number of cases are going up uh, quickly as well. Hong Kong is doing fabulous. And on the right, this is the number of deaths. Uh, so you can see the patterns pretty similar on the to the left. And so I started working on the COVID-19 uh, research, uh, mainly by coincidence. And uh, so my former postdoc, Chao Long Wang, and uh, after he finished the postdoc uh, at Harvard, and he went to uh, Singapore for a few years, then he uh, went back to China and joined the Hua Zhong Science and Technology University School of Public Health um, as a professor. And so in mid-February, and because the, uh, Wuhan was the um, epicenter, so I sent him a message as how he and his family was doing. And he was telling me that he and his colleague were analyzing the Wuhan data, COVID-19 data. So at that time, there was already one case in Seattle, one case in Boston. And then I had a, a, a sense that um, there could be more cases in US. And so I decided to join them analyzing the Wuhan data. So we, uh, and uh, the team worked really hard and then uh, finished the manuscript in a few weeks and then posted the uh, manuscript in my archive and uh, on March 8th. And so the, this, this manuscript got a uh, lot of attention. So got, you can see a lot of a download. And uh, then, um, then also I Twittered the major findings. And, but then this paper had um, just uh, uh, too much material. So we decided when we submit the paper, we decided to split the paper into two parts and also update the result using the newer data. And uh, then uh, the two paper were published uh, based on the Wuhan data. And uh, one was published in JAMA in uh, mid-April. Another was published in Nature in the summer. And uh, so those are the, uh, the uh, driven by the uh, hard work of An Pan and also Chao Long Wang, and both of them are uh, professors and at uh, uh, Hua Zhong Science Technology University School of Public Health, and uh, also they were also the Harvard School of Public Health alum, and also Tang Chun Wu is the dean of the School of Public Health, so th they made a lot of effort in this work. So then this work got quite a bit of attention on the in spring. So you can see there are lots of media coverage and also the uh, lots of interviews. So and the one at in, in March, I did a lot the, lots of media approached me, but I decided to turn down the interview and try to avoid the media. And then later I realized it's important to talk to the media and the, to uh, help the media understand the science and then they can interpret the results better. And the one thing I learned is very important to speak in simple language without the jargon to make the communication effective. And also, um, I was asked to testify in the UK Parliament Science and Technology uh, Committee in mid-April. And uh, then um, the, 
I was uh, honored several of the recommendation I made uh, during the testimony and together with others uh, 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 witnesses and then they uh, were incorporated in the letter written by the committee and uh, that was sent to the uh, Prime Minister Johnson. So this committee consists about eight to 10 parliament members. And uh, so, uh, so that, uh, that's useful to see uh, a little statistical help uh, could help. Um, and so let me start from the major finding of the analysis of Wuhan data, then I'll move on to the US and uh, other countries' data. And so I think now many people are familiar with this uh, uh, terminology, RT, this is effective reproductive numbers. And so if this measures the number of infected uh, people uh, by each case on average. So if RT greater than one, that is bad. So for example, on the right, RT is four, that means one person could uh, infect another four people. Then that means the outbreak um, grows. And uh, so if RT less than one, that is good. That means the outbreak under control. And so here's a Wuhan data. So we showed um, in the two papers that um, the COVID has uh, two features. The first feature is if there's no intervention, it is highly transmissible. And so using the Wuhan data, we showed that if you look at January 20, before January 23rd, and so then there was um, no intervention. So the first case was reported um, on December 8th, and then in the Huanan uh, food, uh, seafood market. And then the, the seafood market was closed on January 1. So if you look at the uh, data uh, from before January 23rd, you can see the number of cases went up exponentially. And then the RT value was estimated on the right, then that is about 3.5-ish. So that means each person could infect 3.5 people. And then on March 23rd, that was the launch of the um, uh, um, a lockdown, city lockdown, uh, with the traffic ban and the social distancing. And so you can see in this case, and this they definitely help. And then the RT value was estimated um, about one, a little over one, but was not good enough. And then the city launched the centralized isolation quarantines and um. February 2nd. And so as you can see, the number of cases dropped dramatically afterwards. And by March 8th, the estimated RT value was about 0.23. And on March 8th, 17th and 18th, there was a launch of the universal screening. And so the this uh, strategy, uh, the, in the US, there was also the um, isolation and uh, quarantine. And also in the spring, there was a uh, field hospital as well. And but uh, the admission criteria was quite different. So in Wuhan, they admitted all the cases, um, including mild cases in the field hospital. And uh, but in the um, in US, and uh, then was um, the field hospitals and only admit severe cases. And the most of the mild uh, cases were isolated uh, at home. And also the exposed people were quarantined at home. So this is a quite different um, from uh, Wuhan. Um, so, um, and so in order to estimate um, those, um, RT modules, and so we extended the SIR model by incorporating the features of COVID. And the first, we introduced additional component we call the pre-symptomatic uh, compartment. And so from the exposure to the symptom onset, so this is the incubation period, it's about um, five uh, days. And then uh, from the pre-symptomatic period to the exposure period, so this is about um, um, a three day-ish, 
And so this is a latent period. So the subject was infected, but it's not um, um, was infected, but is not uh, infectious. And then between the pre-symptomatic period, uh, start of the pre-symptomatic period to the symptomatic onset. So during this period, even the patient did not does not have a symptom, but is infectious. So this period is about a, a two day ish, and then. Um, because during the in the spring there were not sufficient testing kits in Wuhan, and so many of the cases were not detected, and so therefore we built in a component we call the ununcertained component, and so this I indicates uncertained component. So those the curve on the previous slide basically correspond to the I, the number of case daily cases are the uncertained cases. So in the model we built in additional uncertained cases. And then fit model through this uh, Poisson partial differential equations. And that provide the um, uh, fitting to the data. And then after we fit the data, then that can be used to calculate the reproductive numbers. We let the reproductive number change from one period to the other, but analyze the data altogether. So this slide shows that if there were no intervention. And then this will be the projected number of cases in Wuhan. So you can see that in, in Wuhan, and then they are 10 million um, residents. And then that will reach the herd, natural herd immunity when 70% of the residents were infected. So it, natural herd immunity is not a good strategy. And uh, many people would die. And then uh, it's supposed that there is no centralized isolation quarantines. And then this blue curve will on the right, if the social distancing strategy continues, and then because RT is still greater than one, so therefore the number of cases still grow. And so the epidemic still cannot be under control, but grow at a smaller rate. And uh, so the, 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 the strategy worked quite well through this multifaceted um, intervention. And by March 18, there was no uh, confirmed cases. And by March 8, and the city was reopened. So through this, uh, only less than two, uh, two months, and uh, then the outbreak was under control. So this take home uh, takeaway message number one is the social distancing and the centralized uh, centralized um, isolation and the quarantine were critical uh, for controlling the outbreak in Wuhan. So the based on the Wuhan experience, that social distancing definitely helped reduce R to be close around the one, but was not good enough. And the reason is the social distancing help block the community transmission. So that is between household transmission, but there was a lot of uh, within household and also close space transmission. Those are common. And so those need the, the, the transmission chain need to be terminated. So by adding the centralized isolation quarantine to the social distancing that help um, the bend the curve and stop the epidemic in Wuhan. So the results were replicated in other countries. So if you look at the spring data in Italy, that is on the left, and the Germany data on the right. And so they did uh, the social distancing. And uh, uh, you can see the RT uh, uh, lingered around one for over a month, and the curve was not bounded. And so this happened in many countries. Um, so the second feature of the COVID data uh, we found is that it is highly convert. So using this um, model, we estimated 87% of the cases were undetected. So what that means is the, um, the detected cases and the, were only the top, the tip of the iceberg. And so you can see this red part indicate the uncertained cases, and the yellow part indicate those uncertained cases. By including both the yellow and the red, the estimated prevalence in Wuhan is about 2.5%. And so compare this result with the antibody uh, studies. And uh, based on the antibody study, the prevalence in Wuhan is about 3%. So it's pretty close. And so most of the uncertained cases were asymptomatic, were mildly symptomatic cases. 
And also from the data, we showed that and, uh, um, if the control measures are lifted too early, and that, so even there are no confirmed cases, but there are still a lot of uncertain cases. And so those could still cause the disease spread. And so what this, so for example, we estimated the, uh, the percentage of prob probability of resurgence uh, after 14 days. Suppose this is the first day uh, we have un um, observed the cases, uh, zero observed the cases. And suppose one left the control measure after 14 days, and then we estimate what is the chance of resurgence. And so here is the result. So if, up, if we, uh, the, after the first day of no observed, confirmed case, and then one reopened the, the city, and the, after 14 days, so then that means there still could be a case on day one, one or two case on day one, or one or two case on day two. So in that situation, after 14 days, the probability of resurgence is 97%. But suppose after the first day of no detected cases, if one consecutively observe zero case for 14 days, and then one reopen by lifting all the control measures, and then the probability of resurgence is about 32%. And so in Wuhan, even after the city was reopened, and then the control measure was still on. So what it tell us is it's important not to reopen too early. And in the spring in US, and the, the, um, in May, for example, the southern part reopened too early. So they, when we observed a high resurgence and in the south in US. So this take home message number two is, and a single control measure is, is not enough. It's important to have multiple uh, control measures in place to control the epidemic. So those include uh, this model is called uh, the sweet cheese model. So it includes a mask wearing, social distancing, and the widespread testing, contact tracing, and supported isolation and quarantine. And also the, the, the effective treatment and also the vaccine. So the uh, vaccine, as you know, so right now, and the Pfizer's and also Moderna's phase three trial were very successful. They provided almost 95% efficacy. And so this is the uh, cumulative incidence rate and comparing the two arm of the Pfizer biotech uh, uh, vaccine trial and published in New England Journal of Medicine. And so you can see this uh, uh, blue curve is the cumulative instance rate and for the placebo arm and the red curve is the vaccine arm. So in my 30 years as of, um, of both statistics and I haven't seen any of the instance, uh, cumulative instance curve in clinical trial like this. So this is really a remarkable achievement. So if you look at the data, you can see that for the uh, vaccine arm, about 20,000 people only nine people were infected. In the placebo arm, about 20,000 people, and then about 172 people were infected. So the efficacy was 95%. And so it's wonderful that we have the vaccine available. However, having vaccine available is not the same as achieving vaccination. So the major uh, defining challenge in 2021 is the vaccine distribution administration uptake. So basically getting rapidly getting the vaccine in people's arm. So if you look at the percentage of vaccination across different country on the left hand side, you can see the Israel is doing a remarkable job. They have vaccinated almost 2 million people, about 22% of their population. 70% of 60, 60 years older were vaccinated so far. 80% of 70 years older were vaccinated so far. And so they are definitely a role model. And so as I mentioned, the major challenge is right now is the vaccination program. So how can one ensure equitable vaccination and the 
is and globally. And also there is um, significant vaccination hesitancy in US. So using the how we feel data, we estimated about 20% of people uh, were vaccine hesitant. And uh, so those include uh, a significant fraction of them include the people of color and also the people who have social economic disadvantages. And also the healthcare worker, we also found there's a significant vaccine hesitancy. And so that tells us there's a significant uh, importance for vaccination, education, and outreach to address the mistrust. And also we develop an app in early spring uh, that estimate the RT values at the country level, state level, and also county levels. And so this uh, app was led by my two students, uh, uh, Andy Shi and Sheila Giller. And then this, um, this uh, website was featured and in nature in the summer. So this is just the most recent uh, um, uh, RT map from the app. And so you can see that um, the right now there are a few clusters. So you can see that the UK and uh, then and also Ireland and uh, right now the spread is, is quickly. And the a major reason is this new UK uh, variance which is 50% more transmissible. And also there's a cluster and uh, so you can see the left hand side is Iceland cases. You can see it rising quickly. And also the RT value is uh, much bigger than one. And also there is a cluster in Africa and this is a new variance in Africa. And uh, so uh, then also recently, and they had been found that there's a new cluster in South Africa, especially Brazil, and due to this variance P1. So you can see those three variances are different. And so this Brazil variance has been found in uh, Japan. And so you can see the number of cases in Japan is going up. And also in China, as you probably noticed that there is an outbreak in, uh, in Hebei uh, province right now. The current RT estimate is over two. And then the next question we look into is what factors are associated with uh, COVID infection? And so first I'll report the, um, the Wuhan data. So this was published in JAMA in the spring. And so in the Wuhan data, as you can see that um, the older people were at higher risk of infection for each of the period. So those are marked by the purple and also the yellow. And on the right, and so you can see that female and male had a similar risk in Wuhan. And but the healthcare worker, especially before um, the uh, lockdown, and uh, then the um, uh, the healthcare worker were at higher risk compared to the general public uh, in terms of infection, and because of unawareness of the uh, the virus. And then we also launched the app in the spring, we call the How We Feel app. And so this app collects the information of the symptom and the test the result and also the behaviors. And so we had over 750,000 users and also 40 million responses. So the first paper was published in Nature Human Behavior. So those are the major findings. First of all, who were most more likely to be tested in US in the spring? And because the, uh, in the spring, there were not enough testing kits. And so therefore, if you look at the data here, then you can see that uh, people with the CTC symptom, and they were more likely to be tested. And also healthcare worker, essential worker, and people of color, and they are more likely to be tested. And so what that tell us, the people who were tested and was not a random sample, was a biased sample. So therefore, when we look at the which factors are the risk factor for infection, we need to take into account that the people who were tested was not a random sample. And to do that, we use the inverse probability weighted um, procedure and uh, to uh, to do the association analysis in the logistic regression. 
by accounting for the selection bias. So here's a major finding. So first we found that the males are the higher risk of infection and using the US data. And also the pe uh, people of color were at higher risk of infections. And uh, then we also found that healthcare workers and also essential workers, they were at higher risk of infection. And also we found that um, household exposures and also community exposure are significant risk factor. So therefore, if you look at here, the, if somebody has a household exposure, then the odds, uh, odds ratio of uh, being infected is almost 17. That's very high. If somebody has the community exposure, then the odds ratio of infection is about three. And uh, so what this tell us is important to break the within household and the close place such as nursing home, homeless shelters and prison, and also community uh, transmission chain. And so these results are consistent to the CDC result and also Massachusetts dashboard. So for example, in Massachusetts dashboard, and uh, it showed that 88% of the COVID cluster a household. Um, so therefore, it's important to protect um, loved ones, the family members. And also from the how we feel data, we found the most important symptom is not fever and the cough. The most important symptom of COVID is a loss of taste and smell. And the odds ratio is 33. So among those who were tested positive, 40% of them lost taste and smell. And for those who were not tested, and only about 0.6%. Among those who were tested negative, about 5% lost taste and smell. So therefore, this is the most important symptom. And the fever and cough were also important. The odds ratios are about six and four. And also we built a prediction model for the infection. And we found that if one only use the CDC symptom for the prediction model, and then the ROC curve was not that great, it's about 70%. And so if one use all the data and all the symptom demographic information and then exposure information, then to do the prediction, and then the ROC curve is about 80%. And so, but if we only use a very simple four variables, including three exposure variables and one symptom variable, that is loss and taste smell, and then the ROC curve is 80%. So this, so that means if one use exposure and it's just important symptom and to predict the infection, and this can work quite well. And so we use the XG boost. And so this is a scalable gradient tree boosting method and to build a prediction model. And so this is particularly useful for the screening purpose if there are no enough testing kits. And also um, we look at which counties have high COVID burdens and they are characteristic in the US. So what we did was we um, correlate the county level case rate and the death rate with the census data, including the healthcare resource files and also the, um, uh, uh, the census uh, data and also uh, the mobility data. So this work is led by my student, Daniel Lee. So here, let's look at the death rate of geographical distribution in spring, summer, and the fall. So as you can see that in the spring and the, the most of the cases are in the more in the northeast and also the the southwest and so in the summer and the, the most of the cases uh, happened in the south and also in the southwest and the south and the southwest the uh, reopened too early. And then in the fall, and then you can see that uh, the case uh, migrated to the rural area, especially in the Midwest and also not North Dakota and South Dakota. 
So we found by uh, using um, county level analysis. So we uh, we uh, build uh, the Poisson regression model and uh, of the case rate and also the death rate on the county level demographic. And uh, so we found multiple county level characteristics are predictive and for the county level death rate and also case rate. For example, as you can see that this is a, we calculate the cumulative death rate and also the um, uh, case rate. So as you can see that the rural areas and uh, so they have a higher case rate and also higher death rate. And also the, the um, county with uh, white and non-white segregation. And so you can see that they have a higher um, death rate and also case rate. And oh, that one thing I want to mention, as you can see that, and uh, so in US and older people, um, they uh, were more careful. And so therefore there were less cases among the uh, elderly. We also found that pre-existing counties with high pre-existing medical conditions, they have a higher infection and death rate. In particular, counties with high, um, higher uh, heart disease rate and higher hypertension rate, they have a higher um, case rate and also death rate. And finally, and we found that a county with social economic disadvantages have a higher case rate and also a death rate. Uh, so you can see that the county with um, no uh, high school diploma, and so they have higher case rate and also death rate. And so the take home uh, message number three is, it's important to remain vigilant and uh, to keep the control measures up and also speed up vaccination and also improve the vaccine uptake. So it's important to protect vulnerable groups such as healthcare workers, elderly, and essential worker. So as you probably know, in US, the first of uh, the healthcare workers and also the uh, elderly in assisted living and also nursing home, they have the highest priority of being vaccinated right now. And second, it's important to have strategy to for zero COVID. And if one reopened too early, when the number of cases are not sufficiently small and, uh, and also lifting the control measures too early, and then we are going to see the uh, resurgence. So this has been observed in US and also in other countries in Europe as well. And, uh, and also, so based on the last year experience, and the behavior change is very difficult. And so, and also the control measure strategy implementation is the key. And so how can we improve the high, how can we uh, uh, improve the compliance of the public health control measure? This is quite a challenge, especially in, uh, in North America and also in Europe. And uh, so, um, so uh, and also, um, death is not the only endpoint. The how long hauler effects are also important, especially among the young people. So even the death rate is lower, and but there are significant long hauler effect, and so that uh, implies long term health effect. And finally, and. Uh, so even the vaccines are available with a high efficacy. And however, vaccina successful vaccination is the defining challenge and in 2021. And so this uh, implies significant effort need to be made to help with vaccine 
um, vaccination, uh, vaccine distribution, deployment administration, and also uptake, and also the vaccine education. So to improve public, public trust. So to conclude, and so we are definitely in uh, the uh, in this uh, pandemic altogether. So everybody have to be a, a team member to fight COVID-19. So it's important that the data speak and develop a science-driven evidence-based strategy to combat COVID-19. We found two features of the virus. One, it is highly transmissible, and second is highly convert. And also, intervention cannot be a single measure. Multiple intervention measures are needed to fight COVID. And so it's important to detect asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic cases. And so even though they, um, those cases and uh, they um, um, uh, may not have a symptom, but they can still be transmissible. So therefore, widely, uh, wide uh, spread testing is important. And also it's important to remain vigilant and reopen uh, slowly with the control uh, with the when the number of cases are sufficiently small and um, when also with the control measures on and also make effort to improve uh, compliance and also implementation of the control measures and finally and the vaccine vaccine distribution uptake and education is, is critically important this year so this is a joint work with many colleagues and in Wuhan and many lab members and in my lab and many co colleagues in the How We Feel team. And thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lin. So I think now is uh, coming to the panel discussion and also Q&A time. So uh, first of all, uh, I would like to invite our two panelists, uh, Professor Kowling from the School of Public Health and also Professor Chen from the Department of Computer Science uh, to ask questions or to give your remarks uh, on this COVID-19 transmission, et cetera. Uh, on the floor, I mean, uh, the Zoom side, if you have any question, please post your question. And after the panelists' discussion, we will uh, uh, answer your question. And uh, yeah, okay, thank you. So maybe I, uh, Ben, maybe you, you first start. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Lin, a fascinating presentation. And I think some of the work you presented uh, on the initial dynamics in Wuhan and the control measures is really important, showing that just social distancing isn't quite enough. Uh, also need to add in that testing and isolation and quarantine. Uh, I'm often asked about how the, the measures used in China can uh, advise what other countries should do, because I think some of the measures in China can't easily be, be implemented elsewhere, like in the US. But at the same time, I think the massive increase in testing capacity, isolation of cases, even mild cases outside the home, is something that really should be encouraged much more. And the US is still struggling with testing, even today, still not able to give testing to everybody who, who could use it. And that means that there's problems downstream with with uh, isolation and, and limiting transmission in the community. At the end, you mentioned vaccination, and I think vaccination is our way out of the pandemic. But what I'm seeing so far is actually a lot of hesitancy to get vaccinated. I know in the US, quite a number of healthcare workers are reluctant to get vaccinated. In Hong Kong, I'm doing surveys on what the population's thinking about and, and what they're planning. And what we found is maybe 30% of people are interested to get vaccinated as soon as they can, another 30 or 40% maybe wait and see what happens. And then the other 30 or 40% maybe not so keen to get vaccinated, which is worrying because we need to get a high level of vaccine coverage if we'd like to get back to normal and have an end to all those other social distancing measures and the travel restrictions and so on. Um, and I, I think that may take some time. It, we may be having another nine months in this pandemic we may be seeing globally more deaths in 2021 from COVID than we had in 2020 from COVID, despite having vaccines available now, just because it's gonna take so long to, to roll them out. Um, 
I think I, I don't think I have a specific question for you now, Professor Lim, but, but maybe I'll let the other uh, panelists comment. And then if I, if I have a question, come back to me. Yes, uh, Professor Lin, do you have some uh, further discussion before uh, 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 we know uh, the, another colleague uh, asked ask you something or? Yeah, so um, maybe I think thank you so much, Ben. This is really helpful comments. Maybe I ask you a question. And from <laughs> your perspective, and what do you think the strategy should be this year? Uh, get vaccines out as soon as possible. It's really important when you said the, the measure we need is not the vaccine available, but the vaccines administered, particularly the first doses. You showed the Pfizer results showing that the first dose is already very effective. And then, of course, the second dose in line with, with the recommendations. I'm worried that we have a way to end the pandemic and we're not going to take it. In the US, there's a lot of political divide. And I think one side of, of that divide, those, those, that group may not be keen to be vaccinated. But if they're not, we're going to see a big resurgence in COVID once um, different parts of the country open up. I saw the New York governor saying that he thinks now New York should open up because you can't stay locked down forever. And, and we've heard that message before, but, uh, but now we're hearing it from, from the, Dem uh, the Democratic governor of New York as well. Uh, but it's difficult if you open up and you don't have the vaccine coverage, there will be a resurgence in cases. There'll be a lot of people needing admission to hospital. And it's really concerning, but I'm not sure the best strategy to get vaccine confidence higher because there's so much, um, I don't know, so much divide, so much distrust of governments, uh, not only true in the US. And then, you know, we're also uncertain about, about some of these vaccines. The mRNA vaccines are completely new technology. We don't know the long-term performance. Um, other vaccines, not yet had a lot of data on the Sinovac, 50%, uh, but without a lot of information. So I, I don't know, still feel like we learn a lot in the last year, but we still have a lot to learn. And we still need to figure out the, the best way to deal with things going forward. Yeah, so that's, yeah, I, I agree with the, the, all those comments. I think the vaccination program, and um, this is a major challenge right now. And also how can we have equitable, uh, equitable uh, vaccination and this, for example have a vaccine available in Africa and South yeah. Africa and yeah. so they are at disadvantages and so the WHO is making a lot of effort to help the countries in Africa to get the vaccines. Yeah. May I have a follow-up question because I uh, know you asked the question or we must give a remark. Uh, Professor Lee, you, you mentioned that in Israel, the, the, somehow the vaccination is now is a couple of 20% of the population, correct? Yeah, so based on the how we feel survey, I think right now we have, um, we have collected um, vaccination um, question from about 30,000 participants. They mm -hmm. probably the largest survey in the US right now. Just interesting to see is uh, in Israel, then the, how, how about the current number of cases? Is it has some or already some uh, uh, effect or on the overall the, the infection? Yeah, so Israel, I think if you look at the Israel uh, case rate um, the, this week, you can see that the number of cases is going down in the elderly group. So oh. look like I think that because they started vaccination right before holiday. Hmm. And so they are criterias are much simpler than the U.S. criteria. U.S. criteria are complicated. And so right now, the Israel criteria are just based on age. And so basically, older people have a, a first priority. And uh, so, so that's why if you look at the case rate in the 60 and 70 years old, you can see that this week, the case rate in that age group is slowly going down. Uh, because in Hong Kong, we will have a vaccination after the Chinese Lunar New Year. So more or less, I think we will follow this kind of the, based on the age the, the policy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, okay, uh, we know, uh, I mean, another panelist are from uh, Department of Computer Science. Uh, you have some remarks or you want to ask some questions? Uh, yeah, yeah. Professor sure. Lin? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Professor. Uh, Professor Lin, uh, thank you very much for your uh, excellent presentation. Um, so uh, I myself are uh, doing a little bit on the big data research and uh, I'm interested in um, studying the relationship between uh, 
public transportation, okay, and the lockdown policies, okay, how is uh, the economy, and uh, at the same time, uh, how the lockdown, by, for example, closing some major transportation, okay, could uh, improve the situation. Um, so, in fact, uh, recently uh, we had uh, we have got some uh, data, okay, about the passenger uh, check in and check out uh, at different stations in Hong Kong. So, in in Hong Kong, we have uh, a very large uh, subway network called MTL, and uh, we got uh, some data from the uh, first eight months of the last year. Okay, so uh, we are studying, for example, uh, how the events okay that respond to covid-19 like for example uh, the wuhan uh, breakout or, or the, the lockdown of the uh, of the stations how they affect the passenger travel and um, so some uh, very uh, brief uh, result is that we find that uh, some of the local events okay such as um, for example uh, the uh, the border control okay or the shutdown of certain stations they okay, do have some effect okay on the patterns of the uh, of the passengers travel um, so for example we find that uh, the MTL stations in the business and commercial districts okay or the low to middle income new towns or the station areas near the checking points experienced most changes in their patterns yeah so in the in correspondence to this okay professor Lin my question is uh, how do you think about how public transportation uh, lockdown should be controlled in such a way that it has less impact to the economy while at the same time have the best protection against the spread of the COVID-19? Yeah, this is a great question. And uh, so uh, definitely I think the um, uh, public transportation uh, put in a significant risk and uh, uh, for the infection because it's more like a closed space. And uh, um, so, um, yeah, so then, um, so that is, uh, we don't have a data on that right now. So that would be uh, really interesting to see what uh, you find from your data. So what we did was we use, we use the safe graph um, uh, mobility data. And so that is at the county level. And then we look at the proportion people stay at home and within each day and within each county. And then we correlate that with the case rate and death rate. But we don't have public transportation data from the safe graph. And also that data is not, I'm not sure whether that data is available in Google mobility uh, uh, data download either. So yeah, I think the, the result you have will be very interesting in what you find. Yeah, thank you. Actually, uh, I think in, in Hong Kong, uh, I, I don't know if the results are very interesting in Hong Kong because in Hong Kong, I think one of our uh, habits is that whenever we go out, we wear masks. <laughs> and 99% uh, of the people I saw in the uh, MTR or any public uh, uh, transportation, they wear masks. Right? Mm -hmm. Because in the beginning, I, I thought that uh, the transportation could play a role okay, in spreading the disease. But Probably, I think the, the role is played because of the convenience of the transportation. Okay? But uh, maybe in, in Hong Kong, okay, uh, uh, we don't see any cases that show strong evidence that uh, when people uh, travel, okay, they get uh, they got they, they got they caught the virus. Yeah, but mm -hmm. I think in other places, okay, this may be a possibility. Yeah, definitely. I think Hong Kong and China and also basically the country in Asia and people are very good at wearing masks. And but in US, you know, this is quite a challenge. And uh, and also, um, the, the definitely the mask wearing compliant is critically important. So in spring, when we look at the how we feel data, we estimated about fifty percent of people wearing masks from the how we feel data in the spring. I think about now, and I would think that percent it should be higher in the fall. And so there's another issue related to the public transportation. This related to airborne transmission. So if you think about the subways, and uh, so the if the subways, whether the, you know, this, uh, the, the airborne transmission could be an issue. But yes. if you think about the bus, if they all people open window, then uh, as long as you have like, like the, the airflow that will, the fresh air, they will make things much better. Right. So airborne, airborne transmission is a significant problem. 
Yeah. So like in, in, in Wuhan, so in early days, and when what they did was they put the infected subjects and the patient in the field hospitals. And for the people who uh, was, uh, who had a symptom and uh, wore close contact, and then, then, but they were not positive test people. And uh, then they were uh, quarantined in hotels. And so when they were quarantined in the hotel, they put the family together, including the children. So children could stay with the parents, and but they turned all the air conditioner off. And so so they try to avoid the, the, the airborne transmission. And similarly at Harvard, so the Harvard, as you, you we, uh, we um, send all the undergrad uh, back home uh, around mid-March during our spring break. And uh, then we had um, a small fraction of students and who could not go home stay on campus. And then also in the fall, we only have about less than 25% of occupancy. And so the reason is that because of the concern of airborne transmission, and so each, um, uh, each even the Harvard has about something like um, 7,000 undergrad, and uh, but because many undergrads share room in the uh, dorm, dorm rooms, and, uh, you, and uh, so, so therefore we ensure that each uh, dorm uh, room even has like a four bedroom, only one student could stay. And uh, so that try to, uh, uh, try to handle the airborne transmission. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I totally agree right? that the airborne transmission could be an uh, important factor. But uh, at the same time, what I found uh, from the data analyst point of view is that uh, sometimes it's very difficult to get this data because of privacy issues. And somehow this will uh, actually affect uh, uh, how we can use this data to uh, find out the, the, uh, how, the, how, how the spread comes out, right? Because, uh, uh, in particular, uh, if we're talking about locations of the passengers, okay, they have uh, high privacy. So our MTL data, for example, we could not really um, get their identity. Okay, so all the data we get for us to use this data to have very tracking of the passengers. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely the. Data quality is critically important. I fully agree. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vino. So uh, in the chat room, uh, we have uh, several questions already posed in. So uh, maybe uh, personally, uh, we can uh, look at it and <laughs> try to answer one by one or, or, or we discuss together. It actually involved the other uh, two panelists. Uh, if you have some opinions on this. So the first question is about this uh, scientific rationale, uh, why to support 21 days long quarantine period for overseas arrivals now implemented in Hong Kong? <laughs> the first question. So do you have some comment or Ben, maybe you, you know more about this issue, about this yeah, sure. 21 yeah. days? Uh. Oh, I can say something. Um, so there's, there's two concepts that we need to think about. One is the incubation period, how long between when you get infected and when your symptoms appear. And the other one is the latent period that Professor Lin mentioned in her talk. So latent period, how long between when you get infected and when you become contagious. For COVID, the latent period is shorter than the incubation period. We know incubation period of, uh, on average would be five, six, seven days, sometimes can be 10, 12, 14 days. Probably between 1% and 5% of people have incubation period longer than 14 days. Meaning if we have quarantine for 14 days, need to be careful because there could be some people come out the end and then start symptoms. And then if we miss them, maybe they'll give, uh, they'll spread virus in the community. But the latent period is shorter. And actually in Hong Kong, we do a test on day 12. So I, my, my suspicion is, I don't have data, my suspicion is extending quarantine from 14 days to 21 days will probably have a tiny additional impact on the risk of COVID getting into the community. I don't think the third wave or the fourth wave we have a problem with 14 days being too short. Taiwan's okay with 14 days. New Zealand's okay with 14 days. Singapore's okay with 14 days. So I don't understand why they extend to 21 days. I think they're just really worried about the new UK variant and maximizing the, the protection afforded by quarantine, but there's still loopholes with air crew and so on. So actually, I, I don't think the 21 days is quite evidence-based, but maybe you could say it's really, really, uh, 
you know, taking every precaution that the government can. Um, I feel really sorry for someone coming from New Zealand or <laughs> Taiwan who has to wait 21 days when there's there's basically zero risk they have COVID because there's no right. COVID in their country, right? So I, I, uh, it's a good question. Okay. Yeah, Professor Lin, do you have some, I mean, uh, uh, some so but my yeah, I think Ben made a great point. Uh, my uh, I read this news and uh, so I that um, you know there was one case in China and uh -huh. so the person was isolated for fourteen days and uh, then was fine and then this person's and went home and after this person went home, this person was tested positive after afterwards yeah. and then so that's what this triggered um the why the the china changed the policy okay. to Put more that's the yeah. news article i saw okay yep. so maybe we move to the second question about the uh, vaccine shortage uh, will the vaccine distribution mechanism become critical in helping the interrupt the transmission yeah. the second one yeah so yeah, the current, I think, is uh, now uh, some uh, well, uh, I mean, well health uh, countries that uh, they have somehow have already ordered a lot of vaccine uh, for for delivery or whatever the distribution. But for some uh, poor countries, uh, uh, yeah. So what what happened? I mean, we we have some. Yeah, I think the country I'm particularly worried about uh, uh, Africa and South Africa right now. So because I, I you saw from my figure that yeah. they are the new variants on the which appeared in Africa and South Africa and you we know that the healthcare system there is is uh, is uh, challenging and uh, so um yeah and uh, so they definitely they need more help on the in terms of the vaccine distribution so that's why this equitable of vaccine distribution is important. So uh, WHO has been working with many partners, try to raise fund and to get a vaccine for uh, the countries, the poor countries. Okay, I see. Okay. The first question is also about the uh, vaccine. Speaking of the hesitancy, do you think that the percentage side of effect deterred part of the people willingness of the getting vaccination? Some media report that patients have been uh, paralyzed after being vaccinated. Uh, so I would like to hear what uh, what you think about the reason in Hong Kong. So the, in the U.S., uh, there are um, uh, multiple reasons. I think mistrust is a um, significant reason. And uh, so the, um, uh, there is a mistrust. Uh, it is a very historical reason, like the Black community in particular. And uh, so there's uh, lots of mistrust. And in particular, historically, they were um, um, uh, they, they, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, there were cases that um, the black community did not receive fair medical care, and the, after they participated in the, um, uh, in the, uh, in the, the, um, um, in some treatment, and so they did not receive proper care, and so there was a uh, lot of distrust and uh, in the uh, in the government. And so, because we were concerned about being being um, uh, um, the, the, uh, the the vaccine, uh, the, they will not receive the proper medical care, and also, and uh, they there were concerns that um, the clinical trials and uh, did not enroll enough uh, people of color. So, for example. Those two trials has about 10% of participants who were people of color, and uh, so um, so the, there were lots of uh, reasons, and uh, so um, um, so it will be interesting to see the uh, reasons in Hong Kong and why people uh, were hesitant to take vaccine. Yeah, I think mainly you get uh, about the potential side effect. After the vaccination, I think it's something is quite new. I mean, to 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 the people, but but we, we still look at the what happens. Uh, I mean, the government and the, the strategy uh, after this uh, Chinese New Year, New Year, we start this vaccination. Yeah, you know, it, it's hard to say at this moment because uh, yeah, okay. Uh, 
Um, okay, uh, there are there some other questions? Uh, 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 there's another question is about this, uh, about the, uh, the strategy, the intervention strategy is uh, what are the most important roles in knowing the RT, social distancing, testing, currently or isolated? Yeah. Um, um, yeah. I would say all the control measures yeah, are think, important. Yeah. It's not a good idea to distangle them. Yeah, and uh, so uh, I think the, the social uh, social distancing, testing, isolation, quarantine. And uh, in uh, in US and, and also mask wearing, and even the simplest thing, mask wearing is the struggle in US. Mm -hmm. And also the isolation, the quarantine, I think this, um, so the US is, uh, like in, in Wuhan, for example, uh, isolation quarantine was mandatory. And uh, so I'm not sure about Hong Kong. And uh, But in US, this cannot be mandatory. And it basically is voluntary. And so therefore, that has a compliance issues. And uh, and also the people, especially, um, um, like even like in the spring, and uh, then, um, like um, for child, for example, like Chelsea, Tochi is um, a, um, uh, is part of the Boston, and uh, then this uh, Chelsea, a majority of the residents are Hispanic, and the city provided the isolation hotel for the family in Chelsea, and but people did not want to go. And so, because they were concerned that the illegal immigrants, uh, uh, and uh, so, so therefore, they would rather stay together in very crowded places at home and uh, get uh, and uh, being infected, and uh, they did not want to go to isolation hotel. Isolation hotel, even the government provide free um, hotel. Yeah. Food. And uh, so it's it just uh, it's, it's very challenging in US. Yeah. So I don't know about Hong Kong. Is the uh, isolation quarantine mandatory or is voluntary? Yes. Mandatory. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. 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 yeah. This will be very hard in US. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So another question is about uh, this also vaccination. In the current, the China current is a uh, current vaccination campaign covers people aged from 18 to 59, excluding actually the elderly. Uh, this is uh, from some of the audience that he, uh, mentioned that. But in US or in, like, in Hong Kong, we are doing in a, another opposite approach. That is, uh, we start from the elderly people. So why, why is that and which strategy is the better? So again, it's talking about China. And, I mean the strategy and also the uh, I mean the U.S. Uh, the different strategy on the vaccination in terms of the uh, the, the 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 priority. Yeah. Um, I'm I I don't I don't have an answer for this one because I don't know how the the trial was designed. Mm -hmm. What is the exclusion criteria for the uh, the China vaccine trial? And in Brazil, whether the inclusion criteria was restricted to 60 uh, people younger than 60. Mm -hmm. And so if that is the case, maybe that uh, that could um, relate it to this recommendation. I don't know, anybody know? Yeah, but, but no, the, uh, the, the, the in China, the current vaccination, uh, you say that it's from eight, uh, age 18 to 59. That means it's uh, less than 60, yeah. less than 60. Yeah. So whether because in the clinical trial, they only enrolled people less than 60. Mm -hmm. I'm see. not sure. Yeah. Uh, another is, uh, well, the talk about the COVID-19 spread in US, will we be shift to the Midwest and northern part of US in the fall attribute to the lower temperature, something like that. Yeah. He, yeah. Another question is uh, on the COVID-19 spread in US, because it seems to be there's a relationship between the temperature and COVID-19 uh, the starting in this wave in US. What um, the, I, I don't, I'm not sure whether there's evidence on the, for the, the temperature only. Um, the, so for example, like in, the, in, the, in May and the summer, you can see in the south and they reopened early and then um, the, the, there was a resurgence. Mm -hmm. And so right now in the fall and the winter, and because people stay indoor more, 
And uh, so like in the summer, people stay outdoors. And so therefore, when people stay indoor more, and then this likely to increase the transmission. It would be good to hear from Ben, what your comments on this? Uh, it's, it's been controversial for a long time, whether there's yeah. increased transmissibility in the winter. Uh, other respiratory viruses, there is increased transmission in the winter. Partly maybe the virus survives better, partly people spend more time indoors close mm. to other people in the winter. But I think the increases in transmission we've seen recently could also be the virus, the changes in the variants. Um, it's really a worrying time. Now it's like a race against time to get people vaccinated uh, before this, this resurgence in infections gets out of control. Uh, it's going to be tough the next probably two or three months. Okay. Uh, because of time, so maybe I can only uh, 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 raise one more question from the board. Sorry about that for the for the audience. So uh, I think uh, mainly talking about this uh, again the vaccination, because currently some vaccination are uh, uh, I mean in terms of the effectiveness or uh, is uh, very high. I think as shown in the slide by the Professor Lin, but some now just report that is only about. 50% uh, or 70%, something like that. So, so what, what is your comments? Uh, do you have also, do we have some misunderstanding about the so-called uh, the uh, eff effectiveness of the vaccination? Uh, so the, um, um, yeah, I think some uh, like the Pfizer's and uh, uh, Motorola's mm. um, efficacy is very good. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Like, and that's really, really impressive. And so if you want to look at the, the um, vaccine developed by, the, by Oxford and Arizona, and so that efficacy was lower. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also the, the vaccine developed by China, the, um, the efficacy was uh, lower as well. And uh, but, uh, they, they are prone to cons. And because um, the... Um, Pfizer and also the Motorola vaccine is mRNA based vaccines and also the storage as you know and transportation much much more challenging mm -hmm. and also more costly and but the other two vaccines which have uh, lower efficacies and those are more um, traditional uh, uh, vaccines and uh, then the cost is much 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 lower and so like the African country, for example, they will be able to afford those type of vaccines and also the storage transportation much, much easier. So they are always problem and cons. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. So we still look, look forward to this, uh, the, the result or the impact on this uh, vaccination, I think, especially this year to see. So, uh, okay, I think uh, we, uh, because of time, so, uh, Thank you very much, uh, 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 Professor Lin, again, to give us so inspiring and uh, lecture. And also at the same time, I would like to thank you to my colleagues uh, from uh, Ben and uh, we know from the from uh, from public health and computer science to join the panelists and also the four. Uh, I mean the uh, audience to for for this uh, distinguished science lecture. So uh, before we end the lecture, so uh, I would like to show a, a, a certificate of appreciation to Professor. Uh, with I uh, will thanks again for, for your uh, for your giving us the lecture. So uh, I will email a copy, it's all copy, or maybe the faculty will arrange something uh, like the souvenir and then uh, yeah, send, send it to you, okay, uh, by, by mail later. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks again very, very, very much. And uh, we, we maybe, because we have a lot of colleagues uh, working on COVID-19 data and even the vaccination. So definitely, I think that would be nice uh, if we have more collaboration and uh, discussion in the future. Yeah, so definitely more than happy to, for example, this app and how we feel app, I think that has um, collect the vaccine uh, information and including the uh, vaccine attitude, sentiment, and also whether people receive vaccine and reasons why a person doesn't want to be vaccinated. So, you know, if uh, there are opportunities and if people want to collaborate and uh, we'll be more than happy to collaborate. Okay. Okay, thank you very much again. Uh, thank you all of us. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, I think uh, as, uh, in uh, next uh, uh, reason, uh, we will have also another uh, 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 Hong Kong U Science Distinguished Lecture uh, by other, other topics. So uh, please uh, join, join the other lectures in, in the presentation. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye.